Um, so in my talk, I, I would like to uh, share with you some of our insights and, and learnings really from the past few years about what we've learned uh, about the mechanism of targeted degradation and in particular, uh, why we uh, uh, we have really observed how the tenory complex really matter on this. So uh, these are my disclosure here at the bottom of my slides. Uh, so let me see if I can just put the pointer on. Yes, right. So. Um, so, as, as Tanya said, uh, the, you know, this is really exciting time for the field of targeted protein degradation. Uh, it is really taking uh, by storm uh, both uh, sort of academic chemical biology approaches, but in particular, it's taken by storm the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, we've seen in the last five years uh, over 3.5 billion of investment in this area, and uh, um, a really fantastic uh, signs uh, and excitement to uh, for the opportunity to now take this. Uh, oddly looking molecules uh, forward uh, uh, as, uh, as therapeutics. And, and, and so really these slides uh, is meant to illustrate this excitement uh, and, and so this kind of uh, exponential way that we're experiencing here. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of uh, starting from a, a sort of pioneering early concept from the, the labs of Ray Deshaies and Craig Cruz back in 2001, um, really hypothesizing that we could hi hi hijack this E3 ubiquitin ligase is very much understudied enzymes that pharma had really struggled uh, uh, with things like high throughput screening. And, and really the field sort of tipped uh, as uh, we were able to get uh, away from these peptidic moieties for recruiting these E3 ligases with uh, very good uh, dry light compounds like the DHL ligand that my lab and Craig Cruz lab developed early on and this Cerebron ligand uh, that was identified to recruit uh, Cerebron from thalidomide. And then uh, uh, this uh, generating this uh, highly potent bifunctional degraders uh, that then um, now sort of uh, led to uh, an explosion of interest in this proximity-based method. So I'm gonna take you through some of the um, uh, key discoveries that we've made uh, in the process and how these are really influencing how we think about designing degraders, uh, but most importantly, how we uh, how we sort of think about how they work. And so this is kind of like a, pro a primer uh, uh, on Protax, uh, uh, for those of you who might not be too familiar. So uh, by functional molecule, by definition, with one head recruiting an E3 ligase and one other head recruiting a target ligand, joined by a linker. And so by virtue of their bifunctional nature, bringing these two proteins into proximity. Uh, so the E3 is, is written here, sort of drawn here as a blob, but in reality, these are multi-component subunits, particularly of the culinary ligase complex, um, very, very complex enzymes, um, and here is just a review we recently published on. So where you've got the E2 conjugating enzyme that carries the ubiquitin, and by virtue of proximity, then the target protein gets ubiquitinated. The ubiquitinated protein gets recognized by the proteasome and very rapidly uh, degraded with the ubiquitin recycled. And so as the, then the, the protein gets degraded, but the, the protein is not, then you've got the potential to then go on on another cycle and bind this target protein substoichiometrically and sort of catalytically end up degrading it. And, and so uh, this is really the premise of uh, the advantage and excitement about target degradation uh, in, in that if phenocop is the genetics and this catalytic concentrations mean that Catalytic mode of actions means that we can we can achieve this degradation of very low doses in principle, and the proximity mode of action means that uh, we only need binding. We don't need functional sites to be targeted. And so Stu is going to uh, elaborate further on this. But what I really want to take uh, you to take away from from this talk from me today is that there's really a way beyond proximity. And so you know, early in the field, we thought that uh, we just needed to bring this molecule close, maybe not too close, otherwise they would clash. So the link could perhaps needed not to be too too short, but not too long. Otherwise, perhaps you know we wouldn't ubiquitinate our target protein. And what we've learned really over the past few years is is of course this molecule twist and turn, the linker twist and turn. And once these two proteins are brought into proximity, they form uh, protein protein interactions. They can induce uh, the formation of very tight complexes, and so that. Uh, allows us to gain extra layers of specificity, which means we can boost binary binding affinities uh, and, and really degrade these processes at concentrations way below what we would expect. 
And so uh, from these, really, what we've learned is a ternary complex really matter. And I want to sort of take you through the journey uh, of a protac and really a journey that we took in understanding how these protacs work. So the protacs got to get inside the cell, engage uh, to the target and the E3 at the binary level, then form this key ternary complex, and which then leads to ubiquitination and degradation. So you can immediately uh, see that this is a multi-step process, so quite a complex process. And, uh, and so with this compound MZ1 uh, that uh, uh, we uh, developed early on, linking out the HL ligand to this uh, BAT ligand, that for the purpose of this talk, I want to remind you, binds with equal affinity to these different BAT bromodomains from these different BAT proteins, BID2, BID3, and BID4, uh, then uh, this immediately demonstrated, uh, as we'd expect, the power of targeted protein degradation. So this is all now history and published data. Uh, so this is a very early experiment from Michael and Coco in the lab uh, that really showed that indeed this protein were disappearing with the degrader, but not with a, um, a corresponding epimer that no longer binds to DHL and not with the inhibitors. So, uh, and then you can see here that we can degrade uh, the BID4 very rapidly, and this is this transiently expressed uh, GFP protein. Uh, we know MZ1 can degrade this protein uh, within sort of 20 minutes. And, uh, uh, and this is just to illustrate uh, the expected advantage of degradation over inhibition. So we can see right shift here in the, in the cellular potency, as well as the downshift in maximal efficacy, consistent with this very rapid depletion of MIC, which is a downstream gene of BID4, and so these bad degraders are indeed actually MIC degraders, and MIC is one of the hottest targets for cancer. And so even with these unoptimized two compounds, we were able to also see in vivo activity in this, uh, in this mouse model of DLBCL in collaboration with Francesco Bertoni. So I won't dwell too much on this. Um, uh, Stu is going to talk a lot more about the advantages and potential of the degrader in the, into the clinical setting. And what I really want to uh, focus on uh, for this part of my talk is this unexpected but fascinating observation that we made in doing very careful those response curves we saw preferential degradation of one of these bad proteins, notably BID4, over BID2 and 3, consistently, reproducibly in different cell lines. And this was unexpected because, as I told you, uh, and we show this also within the context of MZ1, the degrader could engage the different bad bromo domains with equal affinity. And so we hypothesize that uh, potentially there could be uh, an opportunity here uh, in which we are gaining this layer of selectivity from within the ternary complex. And, and so we went off in the lab and uh, seeing is believing. Uh, and so when Morgan got in the lab, came back with, uh, with the crystals and a solution of uh, this ternary complex, that was really a remarkable findings. And uh, this was totally unexpected. Uh, we didn't see the link as sort of floppy or just sort of a linear, we saw this sort of coil folded in between a very tight interface between the ligase and the target protein where we're burning substantial surface area. And so you can see here in this in this movie that uh, we are forming very, very packed protein-protein uh, contacts, uh, both within the center of this sort of bowel-shaped interface, uh, which is mainly van der Waals hydrophobic contacts, as well as at the periphery uh, of this interface where we form um, uh, hydrogen bonds and electrostatic uh, contacts here uh, between these two proteins. And I just want to highlight here, this is, these are two proteins that don't see each other at all ever in the cell. They don't bind, they don't interact. And yet we could see this, these tight interactions and, and, uh, and in particular from residues that are significantly less conserved uh, than the, the key residues that are at the bottom of the pocket uh, where, uh, you know, we have the pan-selective binder. And so immediately we began to hypothesize that there could be a layer of selectivity coming from this. And so we went back to the drawing board. And so when you think about this, this uh, uh, is, a, is a complex uh, three-body uh, equilibrium. So it's a two-step process whereby the protein, by virtue of being double-headed, can engage uh, with either protein at uh, uh, the two ends, forming the binary complex, and then form the ternary complex. And so in this process, you can define cooperativity uh, or alpha factor, which is really the ratio between the ternary and the binary. And so a positive cooperative equilibrium is one where the, the second step is favored compared to the third step. 
And overall, that therefore impacts the stability of the ternary complex, as you can see here, uh, a positive compatibility can contribute to the, the stability of the complex. And why does that matter? Well, uh, uh, by virtue of being double-headed and bifunctional, then this compound exhibits this peculiar uh, pharmacology whereby we see this hook effect at the high concentration. Uh, whereby the formation of the ternary complex is then competed uh, and ultimately outcompeted by the binary affinities. Uh, and, and so cooperativities can enhance the population of the ternary complex uh, from stabilizing interaction and also alleviate the hook effect theoretically. And so we went ahead and developed uh, biophysical assays and, and approaches. We wanted to really measure this ternary complex, which is something in the field that had not been done systematically. So we began to uh, develop proximity assays as well as displacement binding assays to measure both binary and ternary complexes as well as uh, direct binding assays such as in this ITC experiment. So to cut a long story short, and all of this is published, we made some really important observation here. Firstly, in the context of the protac, we see already a boost in binary KDs, um, but also critically, we saw all of these ternary complexes forming cooperatively. And so as you can see here, we see a, a left shift and the, uh, and the most cooperative of all uh, was the BID4, BD2 domain, which is what, the one that we crystallized. And indeed, as hypothesized from the structure, uh, uh, we were able to demonstrate that the residues involved in the PPI, which is uh, much less conserved, were indeed the ones that contributed to these very different cooperativities and flavors in the ternary complexes. Uh, and so we identify free residues, we made the swap mutations, and we can see both loss and, and gain uh, in cooperativity. And of course, here I've just showed you thermodynamics, but protax convey a kinetic process. And so uh, therefore kinetics of the formation and dissociation of this ternary complex must matter. And so uh, Michael Roy in the lab developed this uh, uh, surface plasma resonance assay, uh, and he, we were struck to see very remarkable differences in the dissociation of these ternary complexes. And you can see here the most cooperative uh, being also the one that dissociated the, the most slowly, BID4, BD2. And a single residue uh, relative to this BID3, BD2 uh, is really what drives these differences in, in dissociation. You can see again here just a swap mutation to illustrate that. And why is this important? Well, if we now look at the degradation by MZ1 of these different bad proteins in cell, we observe the correlation between the initial rate of degradation and the dissociative half-lives of these ternary complexes, with MZ1 driving the faster degradation of BRD4, BD2 being the slowest dissociating um, ternary complexes which it makes entire sense uh, as we are ternary complex driven here, then we would expect it then to see more ubiquitination. And indeed, uh, under the same conditions here with the same compounds, then again, as lab also demonstrated that with MZ1, you can see here uh, a greater ubiquitination for BRD4 and BRD2 to, to a degree. And so this is now really uh, demonstrating in the field. Here's just some compounds from Genentech uh, where they see like three minutes um, sorry, free, uh, uh, I mean, really um, uh, almost a, a sort of an hour here uh, of, of half-life with these uh, picomolar degraders that they've developed and published recently. So just to, to wrap up this part of my talk, I've showed you uh, how this amazing molecule MZ1 uh, can uh, really induce very rapid degradation of BRD4 uh, uh, or more selectively than the other bromodomains proteins by inducing the most cooperative and most stable complex and most kinetically long diff. So this really being BD2 driven, uh, which then drives faster and more profound degradation of BRD4 as a result of higher level of ubiquitination. And so under this regime that uh, uh, here we hypothesize that this may, would make um, our degradation mechanism much less dependent on binary affinities. And indeed, that's what we've been able to show uh, over and over again, both at the E3 ligase end and at the target end. We can lose over 10 folds binary binding affinity within the context of the same molecule. And now we can still see a uh, very remarkable degradation despite that loss of, uh, of binary affinities. Others have shown here that you can also take, uh, go along with other system, very weak degrading ligands uh, and turn them uh, into good uh, degraders. Very weak binding ligands, apologies. Uh, 
Uh, and so, uh, uh, so this is uh, at one end, so you can lose binary binding affinity and still get very potent degradation. But the opposite is also true, meaning that uh, improving the affinity of your target warhead not always gives you uh, improved degradation. I mean, it gives you a greater chance to get an entry into your degrader. But here's an example where degraders made of more potent inhibitors were actually much poorer degraders uh, comparatively than the uh, MZ1 series here. And indeed, you can see here the reason why that is, they're all negatively cooperative uh, and they dissociate much, much faster. So they behave much more like inhibitors. And indeed, you can see here they hook. Uh, they hook very rapidly, which is something we never really saw with the MZ1 series. So this is a key message also here. Um, you know, the cooperativity is not a requirement. You know, you can obviously get very good degradation with high potent binders, even under negatively cooperative and fast dissociation. Uh, but of course, um, it is a striking observation and it's, it, it really then uh, has gotten us to think about, you know, how do we go about now doing uh, protect design? And so can the ternary compass now be a degradation optimization criteria for us? And this is really what we've been uh, began to think and now put into practice. And so uh, conventionally, you know, you, you, this is a combinatorial problem. You, you can make, you know, hundreds of degraders and protax by exploring different combinations here. Yeah, then you go straight into the degradation assays and, and, and that's what you measure. But often, you know, you don't get degraders and, and so you don't know where you what you're missing there. Uh, and uh, and so we hypothesize, you know, how about now thinking about uh, uh, sort of exploring the chemical space and then go about uh, not only measuring degradation, but also looking at these ternary complexes and then take forward uh, inter interesting hits that then we can we can solve structures for and then in a structure by the structure guided manner, uh, then refine. And so this sort of cycle of design make test uh, could then uh, be in a much more rational manner. And this is beautifully illustrated by this story here, which is the output of a, a great team effort with chemistry led by Lofana in, in the my lab at Dundee and Manfred Kogel in Boehringer Ingelheim's uh, group. So this collaborative effort to drug uh, SMARK-K2, a, a really hot cancer target, where the team made a small set of degraders to begin with, uh, which are actually uh, not at all degraders, but one compound, which is very poor degraders, still form decent ternary complex despite very weak binary affinity. And that cooperativity then encouraged the team to solve the ternary structure. Like MZ1, uh, we saw these extended protein-protein interactions, but unlike MZ1, we saw this linker being in a very unhappy conformation and allowed us to identify opportunity to further stabilize the ternary complex uh, from the protect which then the team did very beautifully in a rational manner. You can see here with very small synthetic step leading to this compound here, ACBI1, which then takes our uh, inactive degrader uh, by optimizing every step of this ternary compass formation into a very fast and potent degrader, which then we went on to show recapitulated excitingly the biology uh, with this target for which the inhibitor is ineffectual and inactive, but can provide a foothold now to degrade this protein and recapitulate what uh, uh, we'd expect from the genetic, meaning high sensitivities of vulnerable, uh, SMARCA vulnerable cell lines that are sensitive to SMARCA degradation. And so we now can see this over and over again on other projects and other targets whereby we can take uh, degraders that dissociate really fast and don't form uh, sort of uh, optimal ternary complexes. And yet in a stepwise manner, we can optimize this and, uh, and then we go to uh, increasing degradation in, in, in residence time, increasing decretination and faster, more potent degradation, which makes a huge difference in, from taking no degrade, you know, non-degraded molecules into degraded molecules. And so, you know, in the, in the field, we think sort of bicamerally and, and in buckets, you know, we've got the protax, uh, we've got these molecular glues, which are monovalent and really require this huge cooperativity, but have limited scope. And so this work really illustrating how protests can work as glues too. If we can now glue these complexes to form stably, cooperatively, perhaps uh, when needed, uh, then we can really get the best of both worlds. And so it's really exciting times, but you know, we don't always achieve this uh, for all the combinations of targets and ligases. And so recently we hypothesized, what if we now increase the valency as a strategy 
to boost the stability and cooperativity of these complexes and including also avidity from uh, effective molarity. And this is really exciting uh, latest work that we just posted on Chem Archive, which is a collaboration that Daniel's lab, really championed by Satomi and Kristin in the lab, which I really don't have the time to take you through, but all the data is, is, is now posted. And so I'd refer you to the manuscript to learn more about this. And really excited to learn what you think about this whole new story. So despite the decreased permeability of this product now in the trivalent fashion, we see remarkable activity as a result of enhanced residence time and stability uh, due to the combined cooperativity and ability in this system. And you know, permeability of products again is a really interesting area. You can optimize process for permeability, uh, but we, you know, we often see lower permeability than we'd expect from the parent molecules. And again, in this recent study here, we've been able to show how very limited permeability can be overcome by uh, tenery complex stability uh, and interesting features as well in the process. And so, so really, uh, I hope I've convinced you that we really need to monitor every steps in this process uh, and how we've been able to show that understanding this ternary complex is really critical. And so, and how if we can really glue this protein stably forming this tight complex for long way, then we can get lots of ubiquitination, faster, more profound degradation, and, and then uh, allowing us to leverage with binding affinities and getting much better degraders, potentially really ushering to uh, undruggable proteins. And so this is, a, you know, we, uh, what we've been able to see. I'm not suggesting this is uh, going to be always the case, uh, right? And you're going to get potentially scenarios where, uh, and Stu's going to talk about that, where the catalytic mechanism means that, you know, you've got really fast chemistry, so you might be able to degrade in the absence of this. But from this is certainly what we've been able to see. And, uh, and with that, uh, I hope I've, uh, uh, you know, I've opened to you an opportunity to think how exciting I am and we are in this field now with this understanding to take it to the next level. And so we're doing this by uh, uh, um, sort of making our best degrader available to everyone in the field so you can really leverage and, and make the most of them. Um, this is an exponentially boosting field, as I mentioned. So we've just started recently a target protein degradation journal club in the lab that we make uh, available and we cover the best literature. And, you know, we can't do this all on our own. Uh, and so partnerships uh, between academia and industry, as well as uh, spinning out companies, is a way to, to foster uh, innovation. And so here's just some examples of some of these collaborations that uh, I have in the lab uh, that are sort of both expanding and, and, and recruiting at the moment, both with Beringer and Almiral, which is just joined, and Amphist as a company I recently spun out. And so with that, I'd like to, to finish off thanking the uh, uh, tremendous contribution of many, for both former and, and current group members in the lab, highlighted here in bold are the ones for which I've showed the, uh, the, the result of the data here, and the collaborators uh, for which we're enjoying fantastic uh, shared science. The funders uh, without which we couldn't do any of this and uh, and with that um, I look forward to hearing uh, what's next from Stu and uh, to discuss further in, in the Q&A session. Thank you very much.